the ocean is the oldest biome on the planet, and some of its inhabitants, like the cephalopods, have been in it for more than half a billion years. Today, these are some of the smartest animals on Earth, yet we humans believe that in our brief 200,000 years of rampaging around the globe, we are the first and most advanced civilization there's ever been. Today we're looking at whether this is a reasonable assumption or merely a product of our unrelenting ignorance. And to decide, we're looking at a potential cold case from 228 million years ago. Did a monster octopus compile a morbid death shrine at the bottom of the ocean out of the twisted remains of its enemies? Some think so. So in this video we're looking at the case as it appears, the potential culprits, and the very human biases involved in figuring this out. And stick around as we discuss the possibility of a civilized, perhaps even technological group of animals from the deepest depths of prehistory. Today, more than 70% of the Earth is covered in water. 97% of that water sits in our oceans. And in those oceans sit somewhere between 60 and 80% of all life, being as it is the largest habitat there has ever been. The ocean makes up 99% of real estate for life and it's a 1.5 trillion ton ecosystem of three-dimensional space, 14,000 kilometers across at its widest and 11 kilometers at its deepest. This is an unfathomable amount of space, and if we go back in time to the Triassic, some of these figures become even more impressive. During this period, Panthalassa was the ocean. There really only was one, since all of the land of the time was smushed together in the single supercontinent Pangaea. This single ocean therefore had the full surface area of 360 million square kilometers, more than twice that of the Pacific. And so it's a wonder that we humans have managed to map out as much of the ocean floor as we have. Using very modern multi-beam sonar systems, Seabed 2030 have scanned the ocean floor with a resolution of 10 to 50 meters, using a long-running multi-agency effort that has already lasted several years. And for all of this remarkable effort, more than 70% of it remains unmapped. Yet within that small percentage, they've already discovered 84,000 coral mounds, 100 new marine species, and even four underwater mountains, the largest of which was two and a half kilometers high. And who knows what they've missed? The ocean's spatial dimensions are astonishing enough, but being almost 3.8 billion years old, it's infinitely more impressive when all this living space is considered temporally, and the uncanny ability of the ocean to withhold information goes back way into prehistory. The ocean floor is inherently secretive, being as it is in a perpetual state of motion, erupting at mid-ocean ridges and rolling outwards to eventually slip under the continental crust. And this is where it's pushed back down, melted and recycled. This process generally takes somewhere between 200 to 250 million years to complete, so anything deposited before this time into the seabed is often completely destroyed. But not all of the Earth's water sits on oceanic crust. Continental crust is substantially older and more prone to uplifting, which can push it out of the water and into mountain ranges and plateaus. And this is how the remains of a peculiar arrangement of ichthyosaur spines was found in marine sediments that were 218 million years old. This artifact from a once warm and shallow sea was found in the Nevada desert, at a place called the Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park. Not the wettest of habitats nowadays, but once a rich and aquatic ecosystem. A warm and shallow sea here was once home to the oldest monster marine predators, ichthyosaurs. And these particular ichthyosaurs were some of the largest to have ever been found, members of the monstrous Shonisaurus genus. There are at least nine individuals found here, and some of them make up to 14 meters in length. While that's not so unusual for this genus, what stands out about this particular find is how their bones were laid out. Typically when an animal dies and is fossilized, it's exposed to all kinds of undignified contortions before it sets into place. But these particular bones are laid out neatly into tidy arrangements. And one specific arrangement caught the eye of geologist and legit scientist Mark McMenamin. This cluster of ichthyosaur vertebrae looks like it's just been meticulously placed in a very unnatural way, with each vertebra rotated 90 degrees and laid down like cobbles in the sediment next to one another. In this arrangement, 
formerly known by the very goth metal title of the Berlin Ichthyosaur Death Assemblage, they look uncannily like the ventral aspect or palm of a squid's tentacle. Now a lot of folks would see this and think, huh, much in the same way the browning of butter on a piece of grilled toast may loosely resemble the Virgin Mary, and then they'd move on with their days. But Mark McMenamin is the kind of scientist that dreams a bit bigger than basic empiricism, and to him, this suggested much more than a coincidence. And this is where the controversy begins, because McMenamin suggests that this find may have been the intentional placement of ichthyosaur bones by an intelligent monster cephalopod, a Triassic kraken, that over 200 million years prior grappled with the world's heaviest predators and won. And then, according to McMenamin, dragged them into the murky depths and displayed its spoils in a morbid self-portrait outside of its lair. You might think this is quite a leap from a few simple vertebrate fossils, and you wouldn't be alone. McMenamin has been described as a kook, among other less polite descriptors, and the scientific community overwhelmingly rejects this particular idea. But McMenamin isn't some random dreamer. He's an accomplished researcher with a variety of unique and respected publications on paleoecology. He's responsible for discovering and identifying numerous important life forms that have helped cement our understanding of the chronology and progression of life on Earth, including the earliest signs of complex structures being built by animals. And he's no stranger to controversy. In the spirit of the brilliant James Lovelock and his Gaia hypothesis, McMenamin argues that pure Darwinist evolution is not sufficient to explain the speed of change in organisms over time, and that there must be other synergetic drivers at play in evolution too. So it's clear that McMenamin is the sort of person who's not constrained by nor afraid of the dogmatic approach to research, which might explain how he gets away with saying some of the things he does. But the Kraken idea isn't entirely baseless, and if only as a thought experiment it brings up some very interesting topics relating to non-human intelligence, including our own biases in thinking and the importance of a healthy amount of imagination in scientific endeavours. So let's look at it in more detail. McMenamin argues that the mystery cephalopod, a 30-metre specimen based on the size of the ichthyosaurs involved, attacked its quarry and dragged them into a midden, arranging their bones into the shape of a plate of suckers on the face of a tentacle. There's a lot to unpack here, and the more detail the idea goes into, the less likely it appears to be, but let's start from the beginning. The longest giant squids we know of today reach over 20 metres in length. So the idea of a yet unknown 30 meter equivalent isn't unfeasible, especially when you factor in how terribly both the soft-bodied animals and the deep sea animals are preserved in the fossil record. McMenamin himself has since claimed to have found the fossilized beak of such a beast that would have been around 28 meters long, but it's so fragmented that it's currently unverified. But let's say there was such an animal. Can we look to the behavior of modern equivalents to see what it might have been capable of? Giant Pacific octopuses are probably the best studied cephalopods when it comes to intelligence. They live in shallow water, they're huge, and they can be kept in aquaria fairly easily. They're known to be mischievous, playful, they can solve mazes, open jars, and use tools. And they, along with many other species, are known to create bone piles. These piles, also known as middens, are thought to be used to conceal the entrances to their dens. Further, octopuses are well known to manipulate their environments, even to the extent of forming so-called octopus cities, in which multiple animals live in protected structures that they themselves built. So the closer we look at it, the less strange McMenamin's idea becomes, at least in terms of cephalopod behavior. But what about its victims? We can look to modern animals again for some analog of this scenario. Today, the largest macro predators on the planet, sperm whales, dive into the frigid depths of the ocean to prey on the largest invertebrates on the planet, monster squids. We know this because when they come back up, they are pocked with scars from tremendous suckers once attached to the monster cephalopods. As far as we know, these battles are pretty one-sided nowadays. The sperm whale can weigh over 45 tons, which is a hundred times that of the heaviest squid. But this might not have always been the case. Back in the Triassic, the ichthyosaurs involved in this crime scene were animals with enormous eyes just like the sperm whales, perhaps evolved likewise to hunt at depth. And it's thought too that they were squid specialists. 
because squid beaks have been found inside fossils of other ichthyosaurs, and it's very easy to imagine a similar battle raging between a prehistoric kraken and the Triassic's equivalent to a giant sperm whale. And to return to the octopus examples for a moment, there are multiple documented cases of a cephalopod attacking and killing sharks, sometimes to eat and other times just because they didn't apparently like them very much. So now things are getting a little creepy. But the final piece of the assertion is that these large bones were arranged to resemble the suckers on the end of the kraken's tentacles. And this perhaps is the hardest part to believe. There appears to be no suggestion that cephalopods create art or are particularly aware of what they look like. But of course this doesn't have to mean that that's always been the case. So what are the major criticisms of the kraken hypothesis? The first and most straightforward argument against McMenamin's hypothesis is that it requires a whole lot more assumptions than the alternatives. Researchers argued that this arrangement, while unusual, could still have been caused by decay, ocean currents, or the collapse of sediment in which the specimens were laid. And when looking at ichthyosaur vertebrae from the side, it's very clear that they are far taller than they are wide, so left without any connective tissue, they are very likely to fall and lie flat, as the examples in the Nevada arrangement show. If simple enough processes like these are enough to explain how the bones could be laid out in this fashion, there's just no sense in suggesting a more complex mechanism without any evidence to support it. Given the shape of the vertebrae, they could very well have fallen over after the decaying process had separated them from one another, and currents could have bunched them up together in clusters like the ones found in the death assemblage. But McManaman pushes back against this too, saying that hydrodynamic and statistical analyses suggest the arrangement is highly unlikely to have been caused by water currents alone, and adds that the biserial pattern, that is double-rowed vertebra arrangements, just like the paired rows of suckers on a squid's tentacle, show up again in other finds, including one in a museum piece in Switzerland. However, from fossils of the known cephalopods of the Triassic, this two-rowed arrangement of suckers appears to have not developed yet, and would show up independently in modern species a lot later. Again, this doesn't mean that there was never any such soft-bodied animal with paired rows of suckers that we just haven't discovered yet. But this is kind of the issue with assertions like this. Without any way to test or falsify an idea, there's just no way to take it seriously. Or at least there's no way to establish its likelihood over the alternatives. But despite the popular criticisms of McMenamin, he does appear to be self-aware about it. This hypothesis hasn't been published or really put forward with any rigor, and McMenamin himself describes it as a speculative thought experiment. And the fact that it draws upon real-world circumstantial evidence makes it quite a powerful one in that context. It also apparently highlights two opposing biases in the way humans interpret information. Firstly, the bias that we are the first and most intelligent organisms on the planet. This is highlighted by the very sense of ridiculousness that any kind of animal could put forward something as artistic as this. But as the discipline of behaviorism evolves, we're learning quite uncomfortably that this isn't necessarily true. And conversely, it highlights just how much we can be swayed by what we want to be true. The notion of a kraken or of any intelligent, even civilized life forms other than our own is something so enthralling to us that there are entire agencies set up to look for it in space. And while we're on the topic of space, remember that only around a third of the ocean's surface is mapped to a resolution as high as 10 to 50 meters. The surface of Mars, meanwhile, a seemingly desolate and inhospitable lump of rock, has been mapped out to a resolution of 5 meters. And so the Kraken Death Shrine and the search for it are a great way to bring to light biases, as well as limitations and the role of imagination in the scientific process. And despite the ridicule he faced for it so far, this is exactly how the idea was originally presented by McManaman at a meeting of the Geological Society of America in 2011. It was subsequently published in an article in Nature, generating stimulating conversations around the topic and possibly being the reason why many people think it was put forward as a serious scientific idea. So what can we conclude from all this? We're about to summarize our take, but it's time again to say a quick thank you for watching this video and to remind you that you can help us out tremendously simply by clicking that like button. We really enjoy bringing these videos to you, but if people don't see them, we can't afford to keep making them. So please consider pledging your vote to the great algorithm and let's help this one reach more people. Critics of Mark McMenamin's Kraken idea have gone as far to call it bad science, and this might be a little over the top. 
The idea that this discovery in Nevada represents the portfolio of an artistic mollusk's self-portrait in the mud seems astronomically unlikely when balanced against the much higher likelihood that some old bones just fell over. But as we've said before, all of science begins with an observation and a question. And it does appear that McManaman is honouring this initial stage of the investigation quite well, at least. Imagination is an often overlooked but critical component to the scientific process, but it must be balanced by the rigour of the method itself. And this is where the Kraken hypothesis falls apart. But again, as a thought experiment, it is a powerful one. Does the Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park contain a giant squid portrait from the Triassic? Almost certainly not. Could at some point over the half a billion years of cephalopod evolution in the most vast and unexplored habitat on the planet, a creature develop self-reflection, culture, art, or even technology? Perhaps yes. Given what we are coming to know about the diversity and complexity of non-human intelligence around us today, the chances of us being the first to do any of these things almost seems as ridiculous as the Virgin Mary showing up on a piece of toast. But until we find evidence for it, this will remain a thought experiment. So while McManaman's ideas should never be totally off the table, if they're to be entertained as scientifically justifiable, they need to come with some serious testable hypotheses, if any evidence is to be gathered to support them. Before we end this one, there's some fairly new research that gives a bit more of a solid context to the deposits found in the Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park. And sadly, none of them involve a kraken. While researchers haven't lost sleep over trying to disprove the theories of Mark McManaman, they have still been met with a lot of puzzles at this location. Mainly around why there were so many seemingly undamaged skeletons at the site. Algal blooms, breachings, and other hypotheses have been considered, but these were ruled out. And after eight years of poking about among the fossils, researcher Lene de Polo discovered embryo and newborn bones using micro-CT scans. So now there were adults and newborns present at the site. And perhaps more glaringly, no juveniles. Also fascinatingly, they discovered that some of the fossils there were separated by hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of years. So this it appears, was an ancient safe haven for birthing mothers, perhaps also something akin to an elephant graveyard, and all belonging to a single genus of giant ichthyosauran predator, Shonisaurus. So, kraken or not, this is an incredibly rich and significant discovery, and a poignant reminder that even more than 200 million years ago, complex social intelligent animals were living and dying in ways that we can still relate to today. So... So far, the evidence strongly suggests that the collection of bones at this site come from an ichthyosaur birthing pool. But this doesn't close the chapter in the slightest. Did ichthyosaurs mourn their dead? Did they return to the graves of their ancestors? We know they had blubber. Did they perhaps have an organ like the melon of cetaceans with which they could talk to one another? With every new discovery, we get closer to finding out if we're truly alone in the universe. And with each one, the evidence seems to strongly point more and more towards the answer being no. We hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you haven't already, please subscribe to see the next ones and click on the notification bell so that you'll get an alert when they come up. That's all for today. Thanks again for watching and see you next time.